Hi everyone, my name is Florin and in today's presentation I'll show you how to build a home monitoring system. By monitoring the home, I don't mean simply add a few cameras and call it a day. There's a little more to this. Let's jump in the presentation and see how to build this project. And you may wonder, why would someone choose to build this kind of system rather than buying it and call it a day? Well, in my case, uh, there were a few different reasons. One of them was to have some fun and do some work uh, while getting to talk about it. The second one is that microservices can become repetitive at some point and talking about them can only bring you so much joy in the end. It's also a good opportunity to learn something new. I did enjoy the discovery journey that I took and the end results. This project builds on the automation uh, project where I started to automate my home using a Raspberry Pi, which you can check in some of my previous talks. I also wanted to challenge myself and dive a bit into the world of computer vision, video processing, and do some further automation on that area. Why do I refer to this as a, a monitoring system instead of a surveillance system? My definition of a monitoring system is that it should do more than just what a surveillance system usually does. For example, a video surveillance allows you to only see what's happening, perhaps maybe do some motion detection, maybe some audio monitoring too, but how does that work? Usually you buy the solution and that's it. What about other uh, things such as air quality, noises, detecting the motion? Not all the systems are capable of that. Perhaps triggering an alarm, either silent or not, or informing the owner about possible breaches into the home. So, for example, say I'm not at home and I'd like to receive a message, maybe a picture of the event. Maybe it's a false alarm, maybe it's not. How do I know? Sure, you can find systems such as this one, but isn't it more fun to try and see if it's possible to build it? So, with this goal in mind, I decided to take some small steps into monitoring my home. How did I do that? Let's dive into the presentation of the overall system and talk a bit about the hardware and the software needed to put all of this together. I'll start with the hardware platform that makes running this project possible, the Raspberry Pi platform. In case you are anxious and you'd like to see the hardware and how this all looks, well, there it is. This is the whole system, and I'm going to detail it in a few minutes. To give you a brief a description of it, this is where the Raspberry Pi is housed. These are a bunch of wires going to different sensors and boards. So for example, this is a motion detection. This is the board that will allow us to make a 2G connection, send, receive SMSs, and even dial out if we need or dial in. And this is a board that allows us to do some monitoring of the environments such as air quality, noises, lights, and so on. Of course, this wouldn't be complete without a camera or multiple cameras. This is the development version, so don't worry, the final product looks a bit different, but for security reasons, I'm not going to show you exactly where it is and how it looks like. So Raspberry Pi, as I was saying, it's a small computer the size of a credit card. It was created to teach children programming. And since it appeared in 2012, it was sold in a bunch of devices. How many? Oh, more than 30 million devices worldwide. It was meant to be an educational tool, but it gained traction in additional markets, especially in the hobbyist market, where it's used from projects that blink LED to robotics. There have been multiple devices released from the Raspberry Pi series. I'm not going through all of them right now and through their history. Just know that the latest one is the Raspberry Pi 4. The platform builds on the previous iterations and it's powered by a rather powerful quad-core ARM-based SoC running at 1.5 gigahertz. And it can have up to eight gigabytes of RAM. All of these capabilities make it worthwhile to all kinds of workloads. So for example, you can support a single monitor of 4K up to 60 Hz refresh rate, 
or you can have dual monitors of 4K 30 Hz. This makes it well suited for viewing cat videos or simple computer vision or machine learning applications. Not only that, but when you speak about quad-core uh, ARM-based SoC, up to 8 gigabytes of RAM, you may be wondering, doesn't that sound a lot like the phone I have in my pocket? Yes, it does, because these are the specs of a medium to high ARM device that you may carry around and call it a phone or maybe a tablet. With all this power in mind, this is how it looks. I'm not going to show you a credit card for comparison reasons, but just know it is the size of a credit card. It's covered here with some thermal pads because things can get a bit hot while running. So you need to cool the SOC, the RAM, and some other components. And yeah, you have an Ethernet connection, some USB ports, a 3.0, 2.0. You have the micro HDMI outputs and even the charging port, which is a USB-C. This is the case that you've seen earlier. It's called the Argon One, and it's useful because it allows you to do some cool stuff. For example, if you want to build a project that uh, has a remote control, you can do so. Not only that, but it still exposes the GPIO pins. It has some cooling here. Unfortunately, you can't see, but there's actually a proper fan here and there are some intakes and outlets for the cooling side. So it can get some airflow in and out because things get a bit hot, especially if you plug in so many things that I did. Let's jump to the bread and butter of our project, the software. Specifically, the software that allows us to do computer vision. Among the libraries that can support this task, you can find OpenCV, which is the one that I chose for the project. OpenCV is a well-known, highly efficient, modern computer vision library. It includes a lot of algorithms that are designed for tasks such as face detection, face recognition, object detection, track moving objects in scenes, and a lot more. One of the other things that you should keep in mind is that it's written in C++. This is how the homepage looks like in case you want to, to visit it and learn more about it. They have some really awesome tutorials. There's a forum for Q&A. There are courses that are available. And there's even a marketplace for models that you may want to visit if you are new to the scene and you want to, to build something based on those. Now, I said that OpenCV is written on the C++ programming language, right? That means we need a wrapper to use it in Go. For this, GoCV was created. The mission of GoCV is to make the Go language a first-class client compatible with the latest developments of OpenCV ecosystem. It is actively maintained and it contains many practical examples. So you can see some of the code that you may want to create with OpenCV. It's already being demonstrated in the GoCV website. This is how the website looks like. It also supports other things such as CUDA on NVIDIA GPUs or Intel OpenVINO. I hope I'm spelling it right. So in case you're doing some computer vision related tasks on Intel platforms, then you can get some boost out of that. As I said, there's an awesome getting started section. There's a bunch of code there that you can visit. So kudos to the maintainers. I said that I want to have everything in place to do the video feeds processing and so on. But then what should we do with that information? In my case, I said, okay, Let's flash some lights to make it seem that we are at home if my wife and I are away. Or for example, if there's some motion detected, then maybe we just flash some lights somewhere, in, either in the area where the motion was detected or somewhere nearby, and thus make it look like someone's home. And they maybe heard the noise and they are coming to check it out. So how do we do that? First, we need some intelligent home lighting solution, right? Such solutions are Philips Hue, LeafX, Ufi, or eLite, and there's some others too. I'm not going to jump into all the, the brands. Out of those uh, solutions, I was already using the Philips Hue system. Because of that, the uh, nice side effect was that I already had access to an API that's ready to use by developers. 
In fact, their API is very easy to use and it's really well maintained and explained. So kudos to the programmers on the Philips Hue system. To take advantage of all of these APIs, we have the Hugo package. Uh, not to be confused with the Hugo uh, static site generator, Hugo exposes all the features that you need to create applications from Go that are dedicated to the Philips Hue ecosystem. And with the Lightning SDK in place, flashing the lights in the house was really easy to do. You can even create some further automation. For example, remember when I said that one of the boards has a light sensor? Perhaps you can automate turning on or off the lights in the house based on a schedule. And that schedule can be adapted to be dynamic based on the lightning conditions in the house. This is how the Philips Hue bridge looks like. What is a bridge? The bridge allows you to connect multiple devices, such as lightning bulbs, sensors, switches, or a bunch of other devices they have all into the network and then connect it to the internet and you can control them through a rather interesting smart home application too. Also, you could create an app that controls it, but the remote API requires some special access from the developers. Back on track on me receiving messages. So how do I receive messages? Adafruit Phona 800 Shield is the solution that I chose. It does support sending and receiving SMSs. It does support sending and receiving calls, which also interesting. And it offers access to internet via 2G. Before I continue, I should give you a word of warning. 2G networks are being phased out of the world. So if you wish to build upon this presentation, I highly suggest that you either go for a 3G or even a LTE 4G module instead. That's because your country may have already moved away from 2G networks or it's planning to do so sooner rather than later. How did I connect everything like the, this shield thing and what's this shield? Well, let's start with the connection. I had to write a small device driver, which connects to the Raspberry Pi using the serial interface connection. And that's how it connects to the hardware level and can talk software. The software itself speaks 80 commands, which are instructions that your modem understands and replies to. Let's make a bit of sense out of all of these 80 commands and serial connections and so on. First, let's have a look at how this looks like. So you have your phone and microphone jack. You have your chip that handles all the GSM communication and so on. This is where the antenna goes out. It's a small antenna, but it's sufficient to actually get some good quality network. You have your battery that, are, that is going out here. Ignore my soldiering job. This is the first time I was soldiering in quite a while. So yeah, I wasn't that good as you can probably see, but don't worry, no pins are connecting to each other. I was making sure of that. There's a charge versus run for the battery itself switch here. You can see when the charging happens, when it's done, when you have power, when you have internet connection, thanks to some built-in LEDs. And you can see your SIM card here. Now, this layout is custom to this board, but other boards like the 3G or 4G ones will look roughly the same. Now that we've seen the hardware, let's go and talk a bit about the software. As I said, the software will talk on the serial connection and it's going to issue 80 commands. 80 commands are the short for attention. These commands are what every modem understands. Every command starts with the 80 letters. There are two sets of commands that the modem will understand, and those are part of the basic set of commands. For example, ATD or ATA, and that means attention dial and attention answer. Or there are some extended command sets, such as 80 plus. You can have things like send an SMS message. That's called 80 plus CMGS. Or if you want to read a message, you can say 80 plus CMGR. With all of this in place, how do we write a device driver in Go? For this, we'll use the GoBot IO library. For those of you who don't know what GoBot is, it's a framework that's really 
well suited to control robots, drones, and other IoT devices. If you're not familiar with it, let me give you a bit more of an overview. It's a stable library. It's been out there for quite a while now. It supports 30 different platforms to run your code on. So that means it's flexible and can adapt to different platforms. It also helps you on these platforms to run different devices. So you have plenty of examples to, to use, such as one of the 19 devices that are using the general purpose I.O. interface, one of the five devices that are using the analog I.O. interface. There are eight serial peripheral interface drivers that you can use. And there are some 24 I squared C or interintegrated circuit drivers to choose from. With this brief overview, let's have a quick look over the page for GoBot. Let's jump from just this presentation with the slideshow to some actual code and talk a bit about it and what it does. What we have here is the demonstration code that I prepared for the presentation rather than the actual code that's running in my house for different reasons, mainly because the one that runs in my house, it's never so cleanly formatted. Nevertheless, it builds on the same libraries and same features that my house runs on. Let's talk a bit about how this works before we jump into the whole monitoring part. We can see here that there is a wake word or something that triggers the automation. In this case, I chose to use the Porcupine library, which is really awesome. It can do on-device wake word listening. There's no cloud connection, so your voice doesn't get constantly streamed to a cloud. In turn, means that you can save on bandwidth, on the costs of text-to-speech, speech-to-text, and so on recognition, and use those only when needed. There are different words that are available for this. In my case, I decided for the demo to call this Bumblebee and Terminator. Bumblebee will be called whenever I need to wake up the device and have it listen. Terminator will terminate the demonstration code. This makes it a bit easier to terminate it in a clean manner rather than forceful shutdown. With this in mind, I then decided to use the Google Cloud Platform Services to handle the speech-to-text and text-to-speech parts. Whenever the system will recognize some commands, and let me, let me, let me jump to, to this part. Whenever I listen for the wake word, and if it matches Terminator, as I said, it's going to break out of the loop, do a clean shutdown, and exit. Now, the good part is that after this happens, if the wake word was the correct one and it's not Terminator, then we get to do some listening for the actual command. That voice gets then sent to the Google Cloud Platform. Now, I use Google Cloud Platform because I like the API. It made it easy to handle things. And it gives you some free minutes that you can use every month to perform the recognition or the speech part. In practice, I found that while I'm interacting plenty enough with my system, it's not getting near the quota that would mean that I need to start paying with the cloud provider for these services. Let's dive a bit into this. As you can see here, I'm recording the voice and then I'm just processing it around, making sure that it's a proper wave format and then send it all to the correct output. There's really not much to see here. Maybe another shout out would be to the creator of Malgo library or Malgo. It's a really awesome library that allows you to do audio work on programs on different hardware. And it works cross-platform on Linux, Windows, Mac OS, Android, iOS, and, and so on. If you want to do any kind of recording of different sounds, or if you want to output some sounds, I highly encourage you to see the Malgo library. Okay, so after I record a voice and so on, and I pass it around to the uh, speech-to-text engine, which, to be honest, it doesn't do any, any special thing. It just connects to the Google Cloud platform and retrieves that. I'm passing around to the commands channel. And the commands channel is there because I want to do this asynchronously if possible. 
Perhaps I want to launch a command and say, do something more complex in the house, like uh, raise the window drapes or lower them or turn on the lights in a certain sequence, or turn them off in a certain sequence. And meanwhile, I also want to maybe start the dishwasher or the, the wash machine. With that in mind, I decided to, to do this asynchronously. I'm processing all the in intents of the commands and so on. And whenever I have a command that matches one of the intents that I have, then it's as simple as making sure that either the command itself or one of the alternatives are working. I'm using a lot of words that are specific to the project, like commands, intents, and so on. Let me show you how this works in real code. I have this function called register intents, which is providing the intents in my code. Now I have the command, turn on the light, and I have the command alternative saying, turn on the lights or turn the lights on. Then there are some actions that need to happen. These actions are predefined functions in this case, which are embedded into the final binary. For example, set the light state to a certain value or turn them off, in which case set the light state to another value. There's also the command to dim the lights. There's the command to turn on the sentry mode. There's the command to turn off the sentry mode. These don't really have alternatives because they should be very specific to my knowledge. There shouldn't be anyone else knowing how to turn them on or off. There's also the tell me a joke and say hello, say hi, because those are, let's say, the basic commands that you can implement first to make sure that the system works, to validate the code, the architecture. My first action was, let's have a say hello. Sounds reasonable. Every project starts with a hello world, right? But then I realized, hey, maybe I want an alternative and say hi instead of hello. And then I was, okay, tell me a joke and have some alternative. So this helped me flesh out the API. Then I started implementing more complex actions here. Let's jump into the sentry mode because this is the interesting part. Whenever I say turn on the sentry mode, it's going to enter the sentry mode state. It's going to toggle this mode on or off. Let's go to the toggle part. If the sentry mode is not started, I'm not telling it again to start it, then it's going to start and it's going to actually tell me. Wherever you see the TTS service, that means the text-to-speech uh, service, and I'm calling the speak function because I'm interested in having the device talk to me and say, in this case, sentry mode activated. Now there's the start for our service, and I'm going to dive into that in a second. And there's also turning off the sentry mode. So for example, if I say that I want it off and it's on, it's going to say, hey, I'm turning off the sentry mode. It's going to set it to false and send a message on a, a channel and say, yeah, I want to stop waiting, turn off everything. So how does this start? Turn on the camera, make sure that I'm closing everything that I'm using. Always if there's a close method on the type that you're using, probably the author is intended for you to use the close method. So do that. Make sure to check the documentation, check to see if there are any special conditions which you may require to call the close method, but make sure that you do. There's even a streaming service that is implemented. That's because whenever I'm away and sentry mode is turned on, I'd like to be able to see what's happening in my home. In this case, I'm going to start this HTTP server and it's really trivial to, to do the streaming part thanks to a separate third party library. Whenever I'm reading an image of the webcam, if the image was correct, I can update the stream with my image. And I can then also do some processing. I'm going to apply some transformations, make sure that the threshold for moving around has been met. So that threshold allows me to control the fine grain, like, hey, this is movement versus this is just static in the image that's not processed correctly. After all the transformations are correct, I can say, okay, find me the contours that change. Check out what's different in the image. If there are any contours that the library has detected, then I'm saying, hey, look, alarm state. I should do something because now it's clear that there's something going on here 
yeah, it's probably in a state of alarm. And then either wait for the global waiting thread to exit or the global waiting go in if you want, since we are Go programmers. And the smaller uh, service wait. So this is because we can have the whole application quit or just our tiny service part, the sentry mode. Default is to continue because we want to keep repeating and so on. What happens when I go onto this channel and I push a message? Well, let's check what happens when we create a service because that's when the callback is initialized. And that's something I haven't shown you. If I jump to the place where I'm using this, you will see that there's a, a sensibility of detection, the global weight channel that I mentioned earlier, and the closure to say, hey, this is what happens when the alarm sounds. Now I need only one function because I can control then whatever happens in the function easily. So there's no need to, to have this as a slice, for example. And perhaps I want to have different conditions. One of the conditions was that I found it very annoying to have to receive a message or trigger some procedures for every movement. So if I say turn on the sentry mode and then I walk in the room, it's going to notice every movement between frames. That's great, and that's what we want to do, but it's also not ideal, since that implies for every alarm state that's triggered, it also means that this function would get triggered. And if this function gets triggered, then the speech to text service would be like, hey, <laughs> intruder detected, sound the alarm. And yeah, that's not great to do it on a per frame basis. Not to mention that it could become costly, even though I have a certain number of messages included in my monthly subscription. I can see how 20 seconds of 25 frames per second could send a lot of messages. The idea behind this was that if there's no movement for at least 20 seconds and then there's movement again, then yeah, I can control what happens. In this particular case, 20 seconds is more for demonstration purposes rather than the actual, okay, what's happening here. And finally, there's the uh, lightning service. And this one will blink out the lights and so on because that needs to happen too. In this case, it's going to blink out the lights in only a certain group, but you can change it to whatever. So yeah, that's how the system works. It's basically just a set of, if you want, microservices that are rather tightly coupled to make sure that once you have all the uh, features in place, you can compose them to, to get the end result. You can use some closures and you can use some channels to send around these messages. You probably will say, okay, I've seen the code, but does it work? So yeah, let's see how this works in, in a real life example. Okay, so just to make sure that I'm actually running this, it's going to run straight from the IDE and it's going to run on the Raspberry Pi. Since Golan 2021.1, we have a feature that allows you to develop locally on your machine and then it can either compile the code on your host or you can compile it on a remote host and then run it there. In this case, I chose to compile it locally because I have a bit more uh, power on my computer than the Raspberry Pi, but it's totally doable. And I already had all the libraries, all the C libraries and so on installed and present because I kind of wanted to, to, to make sure that you know, everything works on my machine. Now let's try something like Bumblebee. Turn on the sentry mode. Now, I don't know if you heard that. That's because it detected motion. And as long as I'm moving around, it's not going to be a problem. I can also say Bumblebee, turn off the sentry mode. And see, that's one of the problems of me not speaking perfect English. But sometimes sentry is translated to century. So close enough. Let's try again. Bumblebee. Turn off the sentry mode. I also issued the <laughs> terminate command because terminate, terminator, close enough. And as you can see, the command exited. 
So that's part of the fun of voice recognition. The service is only as good as it gets. But maybe you have a different provider which um, has better quality, or maybe your voice is better understood by uh, these kind of services. But yeah, I think the, the point stands. That's really it. There's not much to show in terms of code because there's only so much time that I have for the presentation. And I think we're running a bit over time. So please get on my GitHub page and you'll be able to, to see this under the home automation project that I have there. I'm afraid that's it for now. I hope you like this short demo of the system, how it works and how it's built. One key takeaway from this is that you can use Go for more than just servers, APIs, CLIs, programming, and so on. And it's a great language to create some fantastic things, including a system that can process video in real time and detect motion in that video. There are plenty of uh, areas in which Go needs dedicated libraries, and GoBot makes things easy to prototype on IoT devices. Those of you who may be passionate about the IoT work may find this exciting and an excellent opportunity to contribute to the Go ecosystem. Another takeaway from this is that you can pretty much automate anything that you can send, set your mind onto using Go, a few libraries, and some hardware. While I'm excited to continue work on this project, I'm also curious about what this talk inspired you to create. So if you decide to take on, on this journey and create something, it would be really cool if you can reach out to me and let me know what this talk inspired you to create. I'll pause for a couple of seconds on each of the following slides to give you a list of components as well as the software libraries that were used throughout this presentation. Just know that you don't need to stick to these, but if you want to replicate things one-to-one, -one, then yeah, this is the one. One ex exception being that I'm highly recommending the 3G hardware rather than 2G. Of course, you also don't need the 8 gigabytes model for Raspberry Pi. You can do 4 or 2 gigabytes just fine. You may also want some optional components that may be useful in case you don't already have them. And here are some of the packages that I use. I hope you enjoyed this talk. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them now. If not, and maybe you want to, to reach out to me, you can reach out to my GitHub username, to Twitter, Gopher, Slack, all the uh, same name. You can see the project, which is open source on my GitHub account. I hope you enjoyed this talk and uh, thank you so much for watching it.